these Old Testament books, highlighting an outline, if you will, with the thought behind that. Zechariah is the longest of the minor prophet books, and we are going to break it in two. We'll do part one tonight, and Lord willing, we'll look at part two a week from tonight. Again, as I said this time and time again, I like to give a little thought, idea, main idea about each minor prophet book from what I have taken from it. It's not the thought, it's not the main idea, so please keep that in mind as I give you these notes. It's just a simple outline and looking at for your benefit, and I invite you to go and look at it, read it, consider it. Uh, one of the things about Zechariah is this: you, you're going to see it repeated a lot in the Old Testament. I mean, the New Testament. Besides Isaiah, Zechariah is the most quoted book of the minor prophets in the New Testament. Besides Isaiah, Jesus quotes it. It's quoted in reference to him, and that's going to be the part two. There's a lot of messianic prophecies, which to me is one of the strongest evidence of the historist, in other words, the authentic, Jesus being real, coming and living and dying. When it was dated, the dates involved, what's being prophesied and what came to uh, fruition. Under God's control, to me, I think when I think about Zechariah and what God and through these powerful visions that he gives to this prophet, that this idea thought is that everything is under my control, which is still holds true today. That sometimes we can forget that because we think of what we see being what is only. And that's not the case. We know that God is above all things, that God's will will be done no matter who or what when or where God's will will be done and he we are under his control and it's his timing and it's his will that we work with not the other way around in chapter 1 and verse 1 it says in the eighth month of the second year of Darius the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the name Zechariah means Yahweh remembers, God remembers, and how symbolic that is as you see through these visions and through the message of God remembering where his people's at, what their situation is, what has happened, what they need to do, and so forth. He doesn't forget, he doesn't have amnesia, he doesn't somehow put pause on a thought and not go back to it and somehow get busy with something else and overlook it. No, he remembers. He remembers. In the rest of verse 1, it says that he's the son of Berechiah and the son of Ido, the prophet. And there's mentioning of sons of two individuals. Some think maybe one's his father, one's his grandfather, but keep in mind, son can be a general term meaning heirs of. Talking about generations of his family, descendants, if you will. Zechariah, as well as Haggai, as we talked about last week, were prophesied uh, to the Jews. They were sent by God as messengers, and their emphasis was for the people of God to rebuild the temple. And we really see that in referencing to the date of the book, and it helps us to remember who Zerubbabel is. If you recall, the, the last oracle that Haggai had last week was strictly to Zerubbabel, who was acting like a governor. Zerubbabel was the one kind of heading up with God's people as they left being in captivity for 70 years. They leave, they return from exile back home. Sixteen years later, after returning home, they start to rebuild the temple. And so Haggai, in what we read in the Minor Prophet book from last week, was about two months' time period 
of him pushing, motivating, encouraging the God's people to really get in, back into rebuilding the temple. And so a little bit after two months, Zechariah adds his voice to encourage the people to continue rebuilding the temple and finish it. Again, 16 years, not a, not a long time when you consider the age of the earth, when you consider about <clears throat> the time of the Old Testament, B.C., but it is a long time when you think about what the temple represented and how we can allow something just to remain as is, to just let it be and not have anything to do about wanting to do anything about it. But it also tells me as well as this, besides putting things off as they did, also the encouragement that we need. Encouragement feeds us. Encouragement is spiritual food for us. <clears throat> we can take an encouraging word and it can motivate us and move us and propel us to do more than maybe what we would want to do because of how powerful a good word is. That's why I think we find in the Bible that we are to encourage each other while it is still called today, the importance of exhorting one another. And I think it's something to reflect for ourselves. What about you? Are you an encouraging person? You may not feel like you're an encouraging person. Is someone encouraging you? And if someone's encouraging you, are you encouraging someone else? We all should be involved in some form or another of encouragement to encourage someone, to build them up. We have enough people, and you know this, there's enough people out there that tear down. That's what they make a living on. That's how they sell things. They tear people down. We have too many of that. We don't need to be a church that is known for that. We need to build people up. The first part of the book is dated so well, just like Haggai. Again, if you look back in Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 1, it's in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, who is king. This is about, again, going back to archaeology, finding Babylonian texts, understanding the times, the cycle, compared to our uh, Julian calendar. That's around November of 520 B.C., when this particular uh, date is mentioned here in Zechariah. The next date we get is in verse 7 of chapter 1. It's on the 24th day of the 11th month. This would be February of 519 B.C. Remember, B.C. counts down. B.C. descends. And where we're in today... In the year of our Lord, A.D., what does A.D. mean? Does it mean after death? It is a Latin phrase that means anno dominion in the year of the Lord. And so we are ascending. We're going up, right? It's 2021. Next year, if next year happens, is 2022. So descending downward, okay? Zechariah in around this time received eight visions. It would seem from the text that all these visions came in one night. Now, when, I, when you study this and read this and you consider just how strange and powerful and odd these visions are, it really reminds me of Dickens's, although this is fictional, The Christmas Carol, where Scrooge is you know, receiving these, these ghosts, these spirits that come, past, present, and future, all in one night. And he's a change. You know, these visions are not so much for Zechariah. These visions are for God's people and what God remembered them. And God was still involved. God was still at work in this very powerful way of information. The last date that we have in the book of Zechariah is in chapter 7 and verse 1. This would be in December 518 B.C. 
In the fourth year of King Darius, it came to pass on the fourth day of the ninth month. And this was a response about questioning with fasting. What's interesting that we see in chapters 1 through 7, we see something that ties us to a date. But in the latter part of Zechariah, there's no dates that are mentioned. There's nothing in chapters 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. So just little information, you know, first half, we have the dates, second half, not so much. As I mentioned, it's the longest of the minor prophet books. We, we're the ones that get, we call them minor prophets and major prophets. God didn't say, hey, I want you to write a minor prophet book. That's not how that worked. They're minor prophets because, for categorized, they're shorter, briefer, if you will, than those of the major prophets. Okay? As I also mentioned to you a little bit earlier, there are some 71 quotations. Think about this. 71 times the book of Zechariah is quoted in the New Testament. If you've read the New Testament, you literally have read a good percentage of Zechariah if you've read the New Testament. So it is quoted quite a lot. And to me, that would show how accurate, how historical that is. Jesus is not going to reference something that's, that has no substance, that wasn't a prophet, that was a book, that just someone just wrote and added. This was something that was a part of God's canon, if you will. To me, I think that the key verse of this great minor prophet book is all the way back into Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. It reads this, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be, the Lord is one. His name is one. Jesus would say, in his ministry, that I and the Father are one. In Ephesians, we see the oneness of things. With, with one Father, there's one Spirit, there's one Lord. There's one faith, there's one baptism. The unity and the keeping the bond and the spirit of peace. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Yet, what is said then still holds true today. He is King of kings and Lord of lords of all the earth. All authority is being given in the hands of King Jesus. It is King Jesus that we will all give an account before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Which leads us into our points to consider for tonight. Number one is this, God's call uh, for repentance. Beginning in verse 3, it says, uh, Zechariah chapter 1, Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. If God's wanting them to, to turn, return to him, then to me that would say that's a big need that the people need to see to repent. Repent is a strong, universal, biblical word and concept and action. To change, to leave, to turn, to turn back to God. The people needed to do that. They needed to return to me. And notice what God said, if you return, I will return back to you. And God's concern for us to repent is still the same today as it was then. 2 Peter 3, verse 9, that God's not willing anyone, not single person, to perish. Think, of it. Think about that. There's some cruel, horrible people that have lived, that are living. God's not willing that anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's God's will. It's what God desires. That we come to repentance. So just as he called through Zechariah in this particular time, we are called through the gospel today by God through his word to repent as well. 
Notice in verse 4, this idea of learning from the past. He says in verse 4, Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets preached, saying, Thus says the Lord of her host, Turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear or heed me. History is important. Our past from a spiritual perspective is important. So is who we are as citizens. of this. It's important. It's important to learn from those things. Good, bad, and indifferent. We can learn from those things that happened in yesterdays. We can take note of those things. They're there for us. They're recorded for us to understand. And here God is wanting God's people, don't be like your ancestors. Don't be like your forefathers. When I asked them to turn, they didn't listen to me. They rejected me. They rejected my word, and therefore they rejected me. Look what he says further in verse 5. Your fathers, where are they? Where are these people that rejected me? They're not here. They're dead. They're dead. Where are the prophets who encouraged them to turn to God? They're dead also. People and preachers, prophets... Messengers come and go. But the important thing here is this. The word of God lives and abides forever. Forever. And that's tremendous comfort that we can have. Learn from the past. As he called upon Israel of that time, they're in the second year of the reign of Darius that we as Christians today, we need to learn as well. We need to learn from our own past. We need to learn from the things that we did and the way that we went and how that wasn't the best way for us. We need to learn from those things. We need to remember the things that we've learned not too long ago and apply those things and motivate us to do what we need to do for God. The second thing that I think is just as important, not only was it to repent and learn, I guess the third, that is to listen to God. Think about that in the 21st century. Sometimes when you're talking to somebody, do you ever feel like, I don't even know if they're listening to me. I felt like that when we were quarantined and speaking, and I'm recording myself in the computer screen and I don't know who's going to watch it who's not I'm just speaking to, I'm only looking at myself I only see myself and that's not any fun whatsoever I got tired of looking at myself and preaching to myself but I don't know who's going to watch it who's going to see it maybe they'll see it maybe they don't maybe who cares but what about face to face and you ever have that happen someone you're trying to talk to yeah 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 I hear you do you no, I, I think we're guilty of that. But the idea of thinking about God, are we really listening to Him? Are we really listening to Him? Are we hearing what He has to say? I think to me, when you look at this, is considering that what God wanted them to see is not only to consider your state and how the situation that you're in and woe is me, but you need to step back and you need to look at everything. Look at your past, look at your present, but also look at the future. In other words, consider the whole picture. And that's what we should do as Christians. We should be whole picture people. We should be people that are willing and are able to step back from things and to see the whole picture. And the whole picture is simply heaven and what we're heading towards. Why Christ came, what we're a part of, what has been established, dwelling with God forever, uh, throughout eternity. Uh, Paul says our citizenship is in heaven. That's reminding us of this whole picture 
not just the moment, not just the day, but standing back and looking at everything. It helps put the moments and the pieces in the right perspective. It does. You know, if you ever had a problem that was so great and so big, and you made it big and great, it becomes bigger than probably what it is, and it's the only thing that we focus on and consume because we made it so big. That's all we see. And there goes stress, there goes depression, there goes anxiety, there goes everything because it's, it's, it's zapping who we are. But if we can stand back further than that and see beyond that, that there is a benevolent God, there's a good God, there's a gracious God who cares about us, and he's proven that already by sending his only begotten son, Jesus, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, and what we are a part of, that he purchased with his own blood, the church. But he's done more than that. But you get the point. Let's begin, and we're looking at uh, God's visions and what God sends to Zechariah, beginning in verse 8 of Zechariah chapter 1. The first is a man on a red horse. I know this is not a rock song or a country song. He says, I saw by night, behold, a man riding on a red horse. In verse 8, it says the rider was among myrtle trees in the hollow. Behind this, this figure on the red horse were brown horses and white horses and other red horses. And we're told in verse 11 who was the rider of this horse. It was the angel of the Lord in verse 11, which begs the question, you know, who is this angel of the Lord? The capitalization of the word A for angel and of the Lord in the definite article, the. Well, the, the, the basic definition of this is an angel is simply a messenger. And so of the Lord, the word Lord there is Yahweh. So the messenger of Yahweh, the messenger of God. The angel of the Lord first appears in the Bible in, in Genesis chapter 16. When Sarai sends Hagar, the maidservant, away, she sends her away quite harshly. The angel of the Lord appears in the text for the very first time to Hagar to comfort her, to encourage her. We see the angel of the Lord in the, uh, with Moses and the, the burning bush that's not being consumed. The angel of the Lord in the presence with the, the, the fire by night and the, and the pillar by, by day. And also other places where the angel of the Lord is present. So the question is, who is this angel of the Lord? Is it God manifesting himself? Is it God himself in some other form? Is it an angel? Or is it the pre-incarnate, in other words, the pre-earthly existing life of Christ? Is it Jesus before we know Jesus, when he came and was born and so forth. Obviously, we know in John 1, 1 and following, that Jesus has always been. It's not like his start date was like us the day he was born, or that he was conceived and then born. He existed before those things. Was this the pre-incarnate Jesus? Now, these are questions, and these are just some ideas, and these are some thoughts that people have, and some things that maybe it was uh, Jesus, as we know Jesus, but not the Jesus at that time because he, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't in an earthly form as he was identified as Jesus. But it was the pre-incarnate Jesus. That makes sense. I know it sounds confusing. But anyways, it is because they think, you know, it can't really be God himself because no one has seen God at any time. Now, why would it be an angel considering it's the definite article the with a capital A and of the Lord? And then I've seen other people say it's, it's kind of a stretch when you think it's a pre-incarnate of Christ because of some other places. And so it's not conclusive. It's just whatever it is, it's a very special angel, very special messenger of Yahweh, of God. And notice what this angel presents. This is what I really spoke about in my devotional. He walked, 
to and fro throughout the earth, reported that all the earth is resting quietly in verse 11 and 12. This was bad news for God's people. Their Gentile nations that had oppressed them were prosperous, and they were resting. They were, there, was, there was no real conflict from anybody else. Israel wasn't a conflict to them. And so Israel wanting some vindication, and Israel wanting God to, to respond and answer their prayers, well, nothing at the moment was happening. And so Haggai's message to Zerubbabel was that the Gentile nations, at the very end of the book of Haggai, the Gentile nations will be shaken. And so this is the event, I believe, referring to Jerusalem being fully restored, where God's mercy will be upon Jerusalem, God helping his people once again. The second vision that we find that Zechariah received is in verses 8 through 21, and that is the four horns and the four smiths. Horns represent the nations. And in these nations, horn is a symbol of power. Just as you think about the landscape of our world today, it is many countries, major countries, powerful countries, and then other countries below them. Horns would separate, which would symbolize the idea of power, of significance. And in this, God's wrath would be towards those nations those horns, if you will, who went out and abide in some way, form, or fashion what God wanted them to, 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 to punish his people for their rebellion, but not having good intentions about that and maybe taking something a little bit too far, which they did. In verse 15, God specifies that you, your intentions were not good, therefore punishment. The Lord will show them four craftsmen in verse 20. These four craftsmen were in this vision would destroy this, these earthly powers. They will, they will be the ones dealing with these oppressing nations. And to, to, to be just what this means is simply a message of hope, a vision of hope to God's people. I hear your prayers. I hear your call and I... I am involved, I am working, I am doing, things are at work here. Again, powerful message, powerful vision, all about hope in referencing to God's people and what they were going through at that particular time. The next vision is dealing with a man with a measuring line. Notice in verse chapter 2 and verse 1, Then I raised my eyes and I looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand, a plumb line, if you will, to level off, to measure, to prepare rebuilding or building of a city. The man was on his way to measure Jerusalem. In chapter 2 and verse 2, he's taking measurements and preparing for the city to be rebuilt. This identity is not very clear. We don't really know uh, who he is. It doesn't say in this vision. But notice very carefully what is said here and what happens when this man who is measuring meets an angel and what the angel says to him. And I'm reading in verses 3 and 4 of, of Zechariah chapter 2. He says, there was an angel who talked with me going out and another angel was coming out to meet him. And he said to him, run, speak to this young man saying, Jerusalem, shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. For I says the Lord will be a wall of fire around her and I will be the glory in her mists. Every just about ancient city that has survived for so many years has a level of form of protection. It was under the Qin dynasty in China and the Han dynasty because the Mongolians up in the north of the rebuilding and the process that took of the Great Wall of China. 
uh, still standing in many places in China today. Walls are a symbol of protection, a way to keep the people inside protected, but keep the invaders outside. What does it mean that the city of Jerusalem will be rebuilt without any walls? There'll be no need for walls. There'll be no need of security from man-made security. I will protect the city of Jerusalem. I will put a wall of fire around the city. I will be the protection of this city. And it begs the question as you look at this and see that especially verse 5, around her I will be the glory in her midst, this, the multitude of men and livestock in it, the inhabitants. Maybe this could be hinting a little bit of a little prophecy of looking ahead, maybe to the reference of what we're a part of, the church. The church has no walls. There are no borders in the sense of, of things that we stay in and that keep things out. God is our source and protection. And God is the one that we are in. And it's through him that we find salvation and protection in his presence that's constant in our life. So again, I think a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, but obviously the rebuilding of Jerusalem, but I think just a little bit maybe a precursor of looking at what we are a part of today. Again, a lot of Zechariah referencing as Jesus talked about and referencing to his ministry and what would happen, why it would happen because of what was said and what was prophesied and told long ago. The last vision that I want us to look at tonight is the cleansing of the priesthood. In this vision, we see Joshua. This is not Joshua of you know, Joshua and Caleb were the spies, and Joshua who took the uh, um, people, children of Israel, after Moses and, and uh, to lead them the conquest again. This is Joshua the high priest. This is a different time. So you have Joshua the high priest. You have, you have the devil or Satan, and you have the angel of the Lord. And this is all in chapter 3 and verse 1. I want to read this. He says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. Then the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. Satan, or the Satan, literally means the accuser. One of the names of the devil, the identity of the evil one, is he is his, his role in the name that defines that role. Satan means accuser. He accuses us. What he wants to do, what he wanted to do with Job, and why he had nothing to throw against, against to God to accuse Job was because there was nothing that Job did that warrant the devil to throw up to God and say, well, this is your servant. This is what he's done. That's what the Satan's job. It's one of the things he wants to do. He wants to accuse you and accuse me. He wants to smear our name. He wants to bring us before God and say, "Well, you know this per this servant of yours, they're not much of a servant. This is what they're doing." That's the accuser. And he's pointing, he's standing and opposing uh, the angel of the Lord and and obviously Joshua the high priest and he's wearing filthy garments, which is symbolic of the sins of Israel, especially when you think about of the religious leaders. Sixteen years, no one saw the need to rebuild the temple. Now they're rebuilding the temple. They're in the process of rebuilding it and getting close to... And, and, and there's a need to not only just to rebuild things from an aesthetic standpoint, but also to rebuild from inside of us as people. 
And notice with the Lord, the Lord knows the Satan's who he is and what he does and his trickery and, his, and he's the father of lies. He knows of his accusations and rebukes him. He rebukes the Satan. And notice what Satan does. He doesn't, he can't fight against God. He has no, against the angel of the Lord. He doesn't, he has no authority and power in the sense of overpowering that. He doesn't oppose when God rebukes. And God has Zechariah's sinful garments to be changed to cleanse garments. This is all imagery here to show the to, to, to getting rid of sins and to, to wash, to, 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 to permeate, to, to refine, as well as to, to make new, to make holy. A symbol is so strong with us, in, um, uh, even in the New Testament. If you go back and, and you look there in, and what it says there in uh, verse 8, I have verse 14, there's not... 14 verses in chapter 3, but that should be in verse 8 of chapter 3. It says, Hear, O Joshua the high priest, you and your companion who sit before you, for they are wondrous signs. For behold, I'm bringing forth my servant, the branch. That's Jesus. Jesus is his servant, he is the branch. The branch that will build, branch out and build the temple, spiritual temple of the Lord, the foundation which Jesus Christ laid and what he purchased with his own blood. What we are a part of, we are called a royal priesthood because of what Christ has done for us. Again, as we reflect and close with this, we'll pick back up if you have your Bibles beginning in Zechariah chapter 4 and finishing the rest of this uh, prophetic book and seeing not only the rest of these visions, but also some of these powerful messianic prophecies that parallels to what Jesus said and others said about him and what Jesus came and did for us. The branch to branch out and to connect us to where we need to be with God. That's all I have for this evening. I think I'm right on time. Let's close with prayer and we'll be dismissed. Dear God, we thank you so much. Thank you for your word. Thank you for just being able to study it. As we think about the Old Testament, some of these prophets, what they had to deal with and what the message they had to bring was difficult and tough, but needed. Sometimes when we read your word, maybe we feel pricked and pierced, and maybe we feel a little offended by it. And it's not that you don't love us, it's not that you want us to hurt our feelings, but you want us to be better, to do better, to be different, and to consider what it means to be transformed better into your image. I pray that we just appreciate what we have in a part of your church, what people were thinking of and receiving visions of long ago, we are now living, abiding, and a part of something very precious. Thank you for all who are here. We pray that everything we say and do tonight is pleasing to your side and glorifying you always. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.